And predominantly what I'm going to try and communicate tonight as we look at limited atonement is it's also the most misunderstood. The most misunderstood. Part of the reason why it's mostly misunderstood is because of the phrase limited atonement. Tremendously poor phrase. Really bad. Of all the names of these five classical points of Calvinism, limited atonement is easily the worst, the most unclear, the most ambiguous, the most misleading. So I'm going to give some alternatives to that tonight. We're going to use the phrase limited atonement because that's kind of how people have come to understand it as the L in the, in the acrostic of tulip. I get that. But I'm going to try and encourage us to think more uh, properly about limited atonement. The verse I'm going to look at is Matthew 1.21, a classical verse that deals with the extent of Christ's atoning work. This speaks of Mary and the prophecy therewith. And it says, she will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You are to give this son, this virgin-born son, the God-man, Jesus Christ, you're to give him the name Jesus, which in Hebrew is Joshua or Yehoshua, which means the Lord is salvation or Jehovah saves because he will save his people from their sins. And that's obviously going to be our focus for tonight is asking that question, what is the extent of the atoning work of Jesus Christ? We're not going... We're not going to ask the question, what is the extent of the cross? Or what is the extent of the message of the cross? That's where a lot of the confusion begins. We're going to ask the question, what is the extent of the atoning work of Jesus Christ? I remarked earlier, as I said, there are many very poor labels for the five points, but limited atonement is absolutely the worst. In fact, I think genuinely, I believe this, there are many Christians going around who are quite hateful toward limited atonement. They despise the idea, they despise the name, they despise what it allegedly stands for because they do not really understand what the Calvinist is trying to suggest through saying limited atonement. So I'm going to give you some definition, then I'm going to give you some alternate names for it. So here's a definition provided by J.I. Packer, and that is this, the redeeming work of Christ had as its end and goal the salvation of the elect. I'll read it again. The redeeming work of Christ has as its end and goal the salvation of the elect. Here's some possible alternatives for you. Particular redemption or definite atonement. We're going to go through this in a bit more detail and hopefully I'm going to be able to present a cogent defense of of this doctrine and also peel away some really bad misapprehensions and and wrong ideas and and liberate you to really see why the Calvinist holds to this particular point. But let me give you some resources first off. The best book ever written outside the Bible, the best book ever written outside the Bible on this topic is without doubt, without challenge, without question, John Owen's book called The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. The best book. But because it's written by John Owen which is English, Latin prose in the 1600s, it's incredibly difficult to work through. It took me two years, two years to read through that book. It's only, what, 200 pages? Two years to read that book. So unless you're very efficient with Puritan prose and and you're quite okay reading English that's 500 years old, go ahead, I recommend it to you all. Have a go, try your luck. But I'm going to recommend a second resource. In 1958, when there was a reprint of John Owen's book, The Death of Death in the Death of Christ, J.I. Packer wrote an introductory essay. It is amazing, well-written, perfectly balanced, scripturally sourced, logical and cogent in its presentation of the doctrine of limited atonement or particular redemption. So look up J.I. Packer. It's free online. Get the PDF or the article and you can read it. J.I. Packer's Intro to the Death of Death. If you throw that in Google, it's going to come right up for you to see. Partly why I really do not like the idea of the phrase limited atonement is because it just doesn't speak to anything in particular. Everybody believes in a limited atonement. Everybody. Everybody believes in a limited atonement. Everybody. In some way, shape or form, everyone's going to limit the atonement of Jesus Christ. Even the universalists. Some people say, well... Everyone but the universalist believes in limited atonement because the universalist believes that everybody eventually will be saved by the death of Jesus Christ. But I've never, ever read or met a universalist that believed that was true of the devil and his angels. 
So I know that sometimes we're a bit anthropomorphic, and sometimes we're a little bit an- anthropocentric, we, we think about humanity, but there are a lot of sinners under God's rule that are not human. No one's trying to claim that Jesus Christ atoned for the death of Satan. No one's trying to claim that Jesus Christ atoned for the death of devils. Everybody limits the atonement one way or another. My point tonight, my ambition tonight, will be to present to you the biblical idea of Jesus who dies to save his people from their sins. As we've already seen, and we've been working through this now, this is our third week, talking about the doctrines of grace, we've already seen in Scripture, we've already understood that the Father, in his sovereign rule, has elected some to salvation. Long before the world, long before creation, the Father has elected for himself a chosen people, a bride for his son, a church and a remnant who will be saved by Jesus' name and his work. And these alone are the recipients of God's matchless, irresistible grace. Therefore, we would say that Jesus on the cross suffered the exact penalty that sins deserved... And he certainly didn't suffer body and soul any more than what was needed to atone for the sins of those who would dwell with him in eternal glory. Jesus didn't suffer half the penalty. He didn't suffer 99% of the penalty. He suffered all of the wrath of God that was due for all of the penalty and the guilt and the shame for all God's people who would ever live. I'm going to try and argue and present that tonight as the most logical and biblically consistent way to think about the atonement. Had Jesus only died for most of my sins, I would still go to hell. That's true of you, that's true of me, that's true of everybody. No one can atone for one of their sins. The Bible is really clear. The penalty for sins is death. Every single sin, every single act of rebellion that's committed by anyone under God's rule merits an eternal, infinite judgment because such is the nature of the wickedness and heinousness of sin. If Jesus only died for 99.9% of my sins, I am in eternal trouble and condemnation because I cannot atone for one of my sins. So whilst we present this as an idea that Jesus died for all the sins of all of his people, we must see that Jesus' death is the perfect atonement for his people. There's three options. We call this a a trilemma. There's only three options here. This is what John Owen brings out in his book, in the first section of his book. There are three genuine options to the atonement of Jesus Christ. Let me present these to you, and then I'm going to try and show which one is obviously uh, the most logical and biblical. First one, Jesus' death atones for all the sins of all people. In other words, everyone's saved. Jesus' death atones for all the sins of all people who've ever lived. Therefore, there is no hell to pay after this life because Jesus has paid it all. It's the first option. Jesus dies for all the sins of all people. The second option, Jesus' death atones for some of the sins of all people. So everyone who's ever existed, Jesus died for some of their sins. That means that no one is saved. Because everybody still has residual sin by which they must atone for. And the third option that John Owen presents is obviously the one we're arguing for tonight, that Jesus' death atones for all the sin of some people. Let me go through these again just to make sure everyone gets it. The first option is Jesus dies and atones for all the sins of all people. Equals everyone is saved. Second option, Jesus dies for some sins for all people equals no one saved. And the third option, Jesus dies for all the sins of some people, of a group, a remnant, a people who are going to be graciously given the gospel. They're going to believe by the infusion of the grace of the Spirit. They're going to trust in Christ, repent of sins. They're going to be justified based on the works of Jesus Christ. So the first option is no limitation in the sense that everyone is saved. But it's limited atonement which demonstrates and teaches that Jesus' death is fully satisfactory for all God's people. This makes Jesus' death a saving act. It's an act which actually saves people because it removes the final barrier. It removes the deepest sin, the pride of unbelief. 
This is part of the issue of most people who don't like the idea of Jesus' atoning work not being for every individual. Because some people genuinely teach that whilst Jesus' death atones for everyone, you better make sure you come on in and get your ticket punched and trust and believe of your own volition and your own will (coughs) or the death of Jesus does not help you. The problem with that is the Bible is really clear that unbelief is sin. Therefore, what's actually being taught is that Jesus died for all the sins except one. You have to atone for your unbelief, overcome your residual stiff-necked and hard-hearted burden. You have to overcome that by your own power, and then you can be saved by Jesus. In other words, the cross of Jesus is a potential only and never actually a ransom. This is deeply problematic, and this is far and away the most predominant idea that pervades Christianity today. This speaks of Jesus dying for the sins of all people, yet not their unbelief. This is the final hurdle that one has to, by their own will, their own power, overcome. But no man can enter heaven without having all their sins atoned for, removed, and blotted out. The teaching here and the the failure here is the idea that Jesus atones for some of the sins of all people, leaving them the responsibility to overcome their unbelief. How do you think that's going to work out for them? How will they believe? How will they obey this command to trust in Jesus, remembering that anything that does not proceed from faith is sin? How do you believe before you believe? It's not possible. So what that means is that if Jesus dies for all of our sins except belief, and that's the final hurdle for us in our human nature to overcome, we will never overcome it. We will die in our sins. That's the tragedy of what's often called an Arminian gospel presentation of the potentiality of the ransom and not the actual ransom. But in the doctrines of grace, in what's typically being called Calvinism, the idea is that Jesus' cross and his atoning work actually, fully, really saves people. It It overcomes all of their sins, everyone, even obstinate unbelief. Can people overcome sin by sinning? Of course, And yet if they don't believe, then they are all damned and no one is actually saved. And Jesus' death was for nothing. To hold to this, John Owen himself wrote, let me read you a quote here from the death of death and the death of Christ. Seems to us blasphemously injurious. The wisdom, the power, the perfection of God as likewise derogatory to the worth and the value of the death of Christ. It presents a God who who predominantly sits in heaven on his throne in his glory, his omnipotence and his sovereign power, and yet, and yet, he's really just sitting there hoping that someone can overcome their unbelief and trust him. And even Jesus hanging on the cross and dying for sins and absorbing the wrath of his Father and the eternality of hell exploded on and in him on that cross, and he must whisper to himself, I really hope one day this works out well for someone. I hope one day someone chooses me. Well, we know this is not the God of Scripture. We know this is not the nature of God's redemption. And so we see that these three options, either Jesus atones for the sins of all people, all sins, all people, we'd have to be universalists. And all of us know if you read the Bible, people are lost, people are condemned, if not just the devil and his angels, but also the Judases and the Esau's and those people of Scripture that are spoken of as reprobate, the unbelievers will be condemned because only in Christ, through Christ, trusting in Christ, can someone be saved. Universalism is not an option. The second potentiality was that Jesus dies for some of the sins of everyone. So at least we can sit back and say, well, Jesus' death is for everyone, but only for some of your sins. In which case, salvation is of no effect and it produces no fruit. 
But the Reformed tradition, that which comes from the exegesis of Scripture, that He will give His life as a ransom for many. He lays down His life for His sheep. As we're told so often in Scripture, that the church is that which God purchased with His own precious blood. Is that God is saving people. God's not waiting for people to elect Him. He's taking the initiative, the prerogative. He's pursuing people, arresting people, alarming people, regenerating people. By the power of the gospel and trust thereof, He is saving people because Jesus on the cross atoned for all the sins of everyone who would believe. So much so when it comes judgment day, And the sinner comes before God and he hasn't trusted in Jesus. He hasn't believed the gospel. He hasn't repented and in faith embraced Christ. And he stands before God and God says, Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. The sinner could not then reply, Wait a minute, God, just one minute. All of my sins, even my unbelief, has already been paid for. So I'll just meander on into heaven quite free to go and there's nothing that you can do about it. As though God would judge the same sin guilty and punish it twice at Jesus on the cross and then the sinner in hell after. But rather again as we reiterate the only biblically faithful, the only God-honoring way to understand the atonement of Jesus is that His death atones for all the sins of some people. It raises the question, I believe, and I I think it's a natural question for people people to wonder and to ask, is there anything in the death of Jesus that's for the world? Charles Hodge, the great systematic theologian, once wrote this, it is not a ransom unless it actually redeems. And it's no offering, sorry, I'll read it again, and an offering is no sacrifice unless it actually expatiates and propitiates. At the cross, Jesus fully and finally consumed the wrath of a holy God against his people, those who would believe. So we come to the question now. Well, hang on a minute. Uh, a Calvinist actually saying that the cross of Jesus Christ has nothing whatsoever to offer the world. Is that actually what Calvinists are saying? My answer is unequivocally, no. Calvinists are not saying that. There is something in the death of Jesus that is for the world. Let me give you a few things, and this is not an exhaustive list, but I I want you to think about these things. Firstly, there is a sense that Jesus did die for the whole world. He died to show them that God is love, that God is merciful. He died to warn people that if they are seeking firsthand to see the wrath of God, they can see it at the cross. All these things become a proclamation to a lost and sinful world. As Jesus hangs on the cross, God is preaching to everyone. This is what I do to sin, even if my own son is wearing it. There's something very real about the cross for the world. The message of the cross is come to Jesus repent of sins, trust in Christ, and then after that, sure, you can say, I guess I was elect. But that's not your business until you've repented and trusted in Christ. The cross says to a dying world that God is love, that God is mercy, and that God is vengeful. Jesus proved all this by praying for his executors. Remember that? How many of his executioners actually believed? How many of them actually repented and trusted in Jesus? One maybe. We have record of one. Out of probably dozens that took part in the entire ordeal, we have one centurion that bows the knee and says, truly he was the Son of God. Yet the most heinous sin that's ever been committed, let me rephrase that, or let me restate it. The most heinous sin that was ever committed, the most wicked sin that was ever committed, was never laid to the charge of the men who carried it out. The cross of Jesus Christ exemplifies and proclaims the love and the mercy of a faithful Saviour, who even while being whipped, beaten, pounded, 
crowned with thorns, nailed to a cross. He is continuously praying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. For if they knew, they would crumble in the dirt before me and beg me to forgive them. But I am love and I am compassion and I am mercy. And so even this sin, let's say that one centurion out of dozens believed. Not one of those other centurions will stand before God and give an account for the sin of crucifying the Lord of glory. What an amazing proclamation of the love and the compassion of Jesus. We know when Jesus prayed, the Father always hears him. We're told that in John, the great high priestly prayer. We know that as Jesus is being buffeted and pounded and mocked and ridiculed, that he's praying for his tormentors, Forgive them, Father. Forgive them. Lay this sin, lay the sin of the execution of the holiest man who ever lived, lay that on me as well. And so he hangs, absorbed the wrath of God for the sin of everyone who will ever believe and still consumes the wrath of the very sin that caused him to be hanging on a cross. It is a frightening thing. It is a fearful thing to have the cross proclaimed to you and to reject it in unbelief. What it cost God to atone for sins is unimaginable. And Jesus never suffered one iota more than what he needed to to redeem the perfect amount of people throughout all human history who would ever believe. The cross has everything to do with the world. But if they are obstinate, unbelieving, then sadly, it will not help them any. It will only condemn them. But it does have everything to do with the world. But to the elect, as we looked at this last week, we spent time looking. If this word is jarring to you, the elect, you just need to grab last week's talk and have a listen to that again. To the elect to that remnant, to to that people whom God wrote the names and the land's book of life before the foundation of the world, to those people whom God did not only foreknow, but he predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus, his son. For them, their sins, all of them, in total, are laid on Jesus Christ, suffered and paid for in full. The ransom is completely paid and they are Liberated, So that Jesus could say, John 10, verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. Hebrews 9, 28 says, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Well, John 15, 13, a very well-known verse. Jesus himself said, Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And the reality is for people who refuse to really acknowledge that the cross is a proclamation to the world, but is an atonement for a few or for many, the reality is when they believe that, they undermine the cross. The reality is that Jesus is doing infinitely more at the cross, and when he dies than an entire world of Arminian preachers even know. He's dying for the sins of believers. He's absorbing the eternal wrath of God. He's paying a ransom to redeem. He's actually saving people. Not potentially saving people. He's actually, by name, redeeming, paying the debt, absorbing the judgment for a select number of people who will believe. He's overcoming all the sins, even the sin of unbelief. We're all born in a state of resistance to God. The Bible's really clear about that. We've spent many, 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 many times speaking about this in the last few weeks. Everyone is born in a state of sinfulness, a state of tragic departure from God. But at the cross, Jesus atones for the sins of his people. He shall save his people from their sins. There is no injustice with God. No injustice at all. Jesus, uh, the Father rather, could never, would never 
force his son to consume the wrath and vengeance due to people who are only going to rebel and end up in hell anyway. To think that Jesus is on the cross consuming infinitely more wrath than he needs to consume is a mockery to the sovereign mind and will of God and a mockery to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Every sin, every sin that's ever committed under God's rule will be paid for. Every sin. God is just. He will never turn a blind eye to rebellion. Every single sin in thought, word, and deed, every single sin is paid for under God's rule, either by hell or by the cross, but it will be paid for. Never will God force His Son to consume the wrath of sins that will be eventually paid for in hell anyway, for God is not unjust. Now there are objections, of course. There are people that struggle with this and and wrestle with this and I made a bit of a commitment early on when we started this, this series in, in the Doctrines of Grace. It's all about Jesus. I made a commitment that I wouldn't try and turn these, these lectures or these talks into a polemic. I, I wouldn't try and stand up here and just you know, bring up the counter arguments and shoot them down and then bring up more counter. I, I wasn't going to do that. I was just going to stand up and present positively what we believe the Scripture is teaching and is the most faithful, honoring way to view God. When it comes to limited atonement, everybody limits it. I believe the only true way to limit the atonement is to say that the actual ransom is only for his people. Not for everybody and not for nobody. But there are objections to this. There are people here right now and, and as I'm saying this, you're like, well, it, all, it, sounds, it sounds good or maybe you're saying it sounds bad, whatever the case may be. But you're thinking to yourself, I'm sure there's a verse somewhere that says otherwise. So I wrestled thinking, well, here we are, limited atonement, should I go through all the troubling verses, you know? But let me tell you something right now, John Owen does that better than I'm ever going to be able to do it. Get the book, have a read, it's the last part, but I will deal with one, just just for the fun of it, right? So we look at 1 John chapter (coughs) 2. This is a really common verse using an objection to the fact that Jesus dies for his people's sins only. We look at 1 John chapter 2. <clears throat> verse 2. Well, why don't we read from verse 1? It's such a great passage, it hurts nobody to read from verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you. This is 1 John chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. That's really important. It's going gonna, it's gonna to occur again. It's really important that you listen to that. My little children. It's a, it's a phrase that's full of pathos, but actually has ethnic implications. But you don't know that. I mean, maybe you do, but it's not obvious anyway. It doesn't jump out at you, but it has ethnic implications. Let's read on. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Good news, right? Amen? Good news. We have an adv- when we sin, we have an advocate. Verse 2, speaking of Jesus, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, that's case closed. That's it then, isn't it? That's, basic. that's it then. Everything I've said so far, I've just been playing a practical joke on you. There it is. Propitiation. Sins of the world. I've been playing around. Let's close in prayer. Not quite, though. Not quite, though. It looks like at the surface what John's actually saying is that Jesus' death propitiates or placates the wrath of the Father for everyone in the whole world. But it doesn't say that, does it? What it does say, interestingly, it says he's the propitiation for our sins. Note the inclusive personal pronoun, our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So chapter 2 verse 1 becomes pretty important now. Who is the our? Right? Who's John talking about? Who is he calling little children? What's the context here? Well, John is a ethnic Jew. He's a Hebrew. Grew up in Judaism, 
came to Jesus Christ through the call with his brother James, having their fishing business with his partners, Andrew and Peter. We know the story of how John was called to faith. A very young guy, maybe 15, 16 years of age. By the time he's writing this, he's probably 40. And he's saying something that's tremendously important if we don't grasp the ethnic connotations. There was really only one way that a Jewish mind viewed the world. That is to say, there are Jews and there are Gentiles. Now, traditionally speaking, the Hebrew people didn't have a lot of patience for you if you wanted to call yourself an Ethiopian, an Egyptian, a Scythian, a Cyrene, a, a, a Cretan. Doesn't matter. You're either a Hebrew or you're a Gentile. So John is trying to ram home a really important point because what began to happen in the first century church was the Jewish believers began to believe and claim for themselves the messiahship of Christ as only being of their ethnicity. Yes, Jesus died for sins, but ours only. This is exactly what John's dealing with here. He's using a Hebrew idiom, not for ours only, not Jews, but the world. In other words, God will redeem by the death of Jesus, people, souls, immortal spirits. God will redeem them from every tribe, nation, and tongue. This is not an ethnic salvation. This is a salvation that God gives freely to all who believe. Whether you're rich or poor, slave or free, whether you're male or female, Jew or Gentile, none of those things relate to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is saving sinners. That's the qualifier. That's what, that's what John's getting at here. John's trying to tell the overly zealous Jewish mindset of his readers, not us only. There were certain churches in the first century that were so Jewish, they weren't even outreaching the Gentiles. We don't want to go near them. We don't want to talk to them. We don't want to be made unclean by them. We're not going to knock on their doors. We're not going to have a conversation with them. If God wants to save them, he can do it. Whatever. He can give them their own Messiah. That's fine. We have ours. John is saying that Jesus is the propitiation not only for the Jewish people who believe, but anyone in the whole world who also believes. There's about four or five troubling New Testament texts which appear on the surface to speak of Jesus' death saving the whole world, but unless you're a universalist, you do not accept that hypothesis. The scriptural reality is this, is that on the cross, God, God pours out on His Son all the wrath and condemnation that's deserved by everyone who will ever believe. There is no disconnect in the Trinity here. It's not like the Father before the foundation of the world elects a people for His Son's name and Jesus goes to the cross and just atones for everyone's sin. There's no disconnect. The same number down to the name of people whom the Father elects, the Son will propitiate the wrath that they've earned by their sin and will overcome their unbelief by irresistible grace, which happens to be our topic for next week. So I would not recommend that we use the phrase limited atonement unless you're willing to go through an exhaustive explanation. Everyone's going to limit it some way. But what we believe Scripture is teaching is that Jesus poured out His blood for His church. Jesus poured out His blood for the, the called out ones, the, the clay toy, those who have been drawn out from the world and by their repentance and faith, they've believed. But even their repentance and faith has been a gift given from above. By the Spirit's imparting of trust, they can now repent and see grace in their life. Would you close in prayer with me as we ask God to bless our time together this evening? We do thank you, Lord, for your goodness toward us. We thank you, Father, that you are perfect in your knowledge, perfect in your sovereignty, perfect in your power, never lacking but immutable, unchangeable, or glorious. We thank you, Father, that your Son shares in these divine attributes. We thank you that He's perfect in knowledge, that He's perfect in power, that He's unchangeably glorious. We thank you, Father, for the same of the Spirit as we know that He, as a person, is fully God and yet dwells with us and in us and is the guarantee of our redemption in Christ. We thank you, Father, as we think about the atonement of Jesus. Firstly, Father, we thank you for the cross. We, we thank you for what the cross does for the world, how it, 
is a blessing to the world, how it's a, a communication of mercy, but for all who refuse to believe, it will be just another judgment upon their heads. We thank you, Father, that in and of ourselves dwells no good thing. We thank you, Father, that in and of us we can do no good thing. But we thank you that the Spirit came. And when we heard or saw or read the gospel, when we realized our depravity, when we realized our debt before you, God, long before you'd already sent Jesus to pay the price. And that Jesus actually saves his people. Not potentially saves and then sits back and hopes, but he actually saves. He dies for the exact number of all the sins of those whom the Father elected. And we know, Father, that this is difficult sometimes to, sometimes to understand and it's absolutely impossible to comprehend the mystery surrounding this, but we know the Scripture has said it so clearly for us to believe. That those whom the Father calls and grants repentance and faith are the same number that Jesus atones for and the same number that the Spirit sanctifies in grace. So we thank you, Father, for the cross. And more than that, this evening, I thank you for the atonement. I thank you for the ransom. As Charles Hodge had said, that it's only a ransom if it actually redeems. Not if it kind of redeems or maybe redeems or possibly redeems, but it's only a ransom if it actually redeems. And we know, Father, that there will be none who stand before you, who's trusted in Jesus, had their sins paid for at the cross, who'd be able to pat themselves on the back and thank themselves for their wisdom or their nobility or their intelligence, but all will bow the knee and say, thank you, Jesus. In this, we know, Father, that we are loved. That while we were yet sinners, Christ has died for us and paid the infinite penalty that our sins deserve. And I pray, Father, tonight for all of us as we've sat and we've listened and we've thought and hopefully we've been critical as we've studied these things. I I thank you, Father, there are people here this evening who are believers and and they do trust Jesus and they've come to an understanding of the immeasurable grace of God. And I thank you for them, Lord. And I also recognize that in such a crowd like this tonight, there are people who are yet to believe. There are people who are yet to trust And they feel like they've got a lot of time and they feel like they've got a lot of opportunity and they feel like they've got a lot of space. But Father, I pray your spirit would alarm them tonight, arrest them tonight. May they know that hell is real and it's eternal and only in Christ can salvation be ever attained. And they wouldn't let these things be a stumbling block. Well, did Jesus die for me or did the Father elect me? But no one would bother with those questions but only the imperative of the gospel. Trust in Christ today. I thank you, Father, that your spirit is irresistible. Your grace is irresistible. I thank you, Father, that your grace overcame me, my objections, my unbelief. And I thank you that the same is said by all who have come to faith in Christ. Pray all these things, Father, to your glory, through Jesus, your Son, in your spirit, and all who agreed said, Amen. Thank you and God bless.